fuck, man. I got bad news. What? He found out, dude. Um, Steve Miocic. He he called me personally. You know, <laughs> he listens to the show, of course, as all the best fighters do, and he just said how disappointed in us he was for picking against. The word disrespect was used more than once. He's not even mad. He's just disappointed. I mean, I think it was honestly, it was kind of hard to understand what he was saying at parts, <laughs> but he did seem upset. And welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands. I am your host, Connor Rebush. With me is Dr. Patrick Wyman, as always. And uh, today, we are here to suffer for our sins. Uh, <laughs> we're in serious trouble, Pat. I mean, I know normally we get fight picks wrong all the time. Uh, in fact, we've had a pretty dog shit month as far <laughs> as correct <laughs> predictions go. But this one really matters. Um, we're in trouble here. And uh, I just think that we should use the rest of this episode to coax Steve Miocic back into – to coax ourselves back into Steve Miocic's favor, rather. Mm -hmm. Now, as the first heavyweight champion to defend the UFC belt three times in a row, uh, our life is in his hands. And he knows. He knows what we did. He does. He does know what we did. Though I'll say, at least I picked him over Alistair Overing. Yeah. Which you did not. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but but seriously, out of so Stipe has Stipe won the title, defended the title three has now defended the title three times. I think it's worth asking why I only picked him in one of those four fights. Uh, yeah, actually that's an interesting him, question. Yeah, I picked him over Overeem. Um did not I picked Nganu to beat him. I picked uh Junior Dos Santos to beat him when they fought when they fought for the second time in May, and I picked Fabricio Verdum to beat him. So I think it's it's worth taking a step back and asking why it is that I do not seem to be able to uh, pick Stipe, a Stipe Miocic fight correctly. Um, in this case, it's fairly clear to me. It's because I love talent and Nganu is super fucking talented. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I fell in love with that, as did the as did uh, most of the betting money on this fight. There is a reason Nganu was the favorite. Um, and also, as Miocic's face can attest after the first round of that fight, there's a reason why Nganu was the favorite. Um, now, with that said, there were some fairly like there were some fairly clear things that we overlooked here, namely Nganu's uh, limited gas tank and his complete inability to wrestle. Stipe didn't have to do anything complicated to get him down. He just started shooting takedowns and Nganu couldn't stop them because he was exhausted. Like that's it's pretty straightforward. Like there's not a lot of deep technical analysis to be done here um, after the first round. We can talk about the first round in a minute, but it's a fairly straightforward fight. It was like takedowns in the top ride and pinning and gone against the fence where he couldn't escape. Mm -hmm. was it? I mean, honestly, my, my, uh, the thing I didn't expect was I didn't account for Nganu's ex inexperience. I don't think like, uh, it's this, this was very much a, uh, this was very much a McGregor Diaz one kind of thing where, you know, one fighter is just completely overconfident and just destroys themselves thinking that they're going to easily destroy their opponent, and then the crafty opponent punishes them for that. Uh, the, the difference is, like, the thing that really threw me uh, was that there was evidence to suggest that Conor McGregor was not only headed in that direction, but firmly on the puncher's path before he fell to Nate Diaz. I didn't pick Nate Diaz to beat him, but I did write those puncher's path pieces thinking at some point soon he's going to pay for spending more time in the pocket, for getting more aggressive, for throwing so much more volume, for turning into somebody who expects to put people away early. Nganu seemed to be moving in the opposite direction to me. I really thought we were seeing somebody on a phenom track who was uh, who was just sort of defying the normal trend and very quickly learning what his style was. And it didn't look like that was the case in this fight. I want, I want to yeah. here, here's a topic to 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 breach patience. Patience is something I thought Nganu had exhibited quite well in previous bouts. Where was the patience here? Well, so I think it's worth stopping for a second to, to focus on that, because if you had asked me what Nganu's defining characteristic was as a fighter going into this, I would have said patience. Yeah. 
more than even more than the physicality even i would have said it's that he's patient it's that he waits for his opportunities to come to him so he doesn't overextend um I, it looked and it's easy to kind of forget this i think because Nganu had shown so much maturity in in what we'd seen from him up to that this point it looked like the moment got to him a little bit like oh, about halfway for sure. through the first round he kind of realized like oh shit i'm in a heavyweight title fight with stipe miocic this guy isn't going away I'm hitting him with big shots and it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. um, and like there's I, I think back to a conversation I had with with Greg Jackson uh, back last. This was like 2016, um, summer of 2016, after Lando Venata lost to Tony Ferguson. And Greg was talking about cardio and he was talking about cardio, not as a matter of physical conditioning, because I would guess that Francis Ngannou is in extraordinary shape by any reasonable standard as a heavyweight fighter. But it's panicking. Yeah. Panicking is what gasses you. It's when your mind gets out of control and you start doing things that you shouldn't do. You forget your technique. Um, and Nganu forgot his technique. Like if you had looked at a, at a straightforward path of Nganu's raw technique, the way that he, the way that he defended takedowns, the way that he threw punches, um, his footwork, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it looked like he was getting better in every fight. But the second that he started to panic a little bit, the second it became clear Miocic wasn't going to get out of there, he started winging shots. Um, winging shots takes a lot of energy. He start, he forgot his technique when he was trying to defend takedowns. He started exploding back to his feet. Like, he panicked. And when you panic, that, that drains your gas tank very quickly for a variety of different reasons, including just your basic inability to, to breathe and keep your heart rate down. Yeah, no shit. He, he yeah. and Nganu and Miocic were both exhausted by the end of the second round of this fight. Uh, I want to I want to underscore that like Nganu definitely got tired faster and pro and never seemed to get out of the depths of that exhaustion until maybe the last couple minutes of the fight. He mustered enough energy for some for some salvos in a, in a late attempt to rally. But Miocic was tired as fuck after the second round. The difference is and I this is something I, I tried to point out in the, the piece I wrote just at the end of last week um, was called three unanswered questions for Francis Nganu was that Miocic has been tired before in a fight. He's been there. He's had a fight feel like it's slipping out of his control, and he he understands what it feels like to fight through that, to conserve yeah. energy, not to panic, and, and to deal with that. And I'd like, really, experience came through here. I do feel a little silly for not banking just on Miocic's experience because it is normally something I favor, but just from the small sample sizes we saw of Nganu before this fight, I really thought... We were seeing somebody who was defying the normal trend uh, yeah, of how he, a fighter develops. Yeah, and I mean, and I think maybe that in itself is is the lesson to draw from this, as far as Ngannou is concerned. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the lessons to draw about Miocic here in a second. Yeah. Um, but as far as Ngannou is concerned, like, it's easy to draw a narrative when you don't have that much information there. Right. Like we just yep. do not have that much information. On, or we just did not have that much going into this. We have a great deal more now. Um but there's there there's a danger to that. If you're if the narrative is right, you look like a genius, right? Like you look like you've extrapolated from this limited from this limited set of stuff um, some grand principle. And if and and if it hits, then you're a genius for it. But if and when it doesn't, you look like a total idiot because you're like, how could I have thought on the basis of this tiny little amount of information I had available to me that this was going to work out? Well, listen, um, listen, I think the fans should be able to drag us. And I mean, literally drag us behind their trucks, uh, but patrons only. That's my rule. Only people who support us on Patreon. <laughs> so if you support the show and you pay us money and you're mad, you can drag us. The rest of you get in line <laughs> or pull out that credit card and then you'll have permission to punish us for our, <laughs> our ill-advised pick. Yes. All right. So. Let's talk a little bit about Miocic. Uh, we, yeah. we, we could talk about Nganu's sort of failure. I do think in a lot of ways, uh, in ways that perhaps we should have seen coming, though, though certainly ways I didn't expect based in his last fight, Nganu played right into Miocic's hands. But those were very capable hands that he played into. Miocic, I thought, I mean, he approached this fight, for, for all of me not picking him, he did approach this fight the way that I said I thought he should. He denied exchanges as much as he could. He did a lot of fainting, pot shotting, and very short combinations. And I want to uh, read to you what his coach told him after the end of the first round. Marcus Marinelli said, don't fall asleep in that mid-range. I don't want you fighting in mid-range. 
And that's what he did for the most part. Um, and you could see mid range was super duper dangerous because even when Nganu was exhausted and had barely any drive, there was still so much weight behind his hands that he was snapping Miocic's head around just by basically pawing at him. Uh, and that was the only times that Miocic was really in trouble is when he was drifting in that mid range, right around that 80% extension mark of Nganu's arms. But otherwise, I thought he did a pretty phenomenal job of mitigating risks and uh, managing his distance really, really well. And then, of course, the wrestling. Miocic literally uh, eschewed MMA wrestling in favor of just wrestling wrestling. I don't know exactly what you call that position he kept holding Nganu down in. Uh, I called it, jokingly in my notes, an eighth Nelson, because it's just an arm <laughs> across the back of the neck with nothing to support it. But... I mean, I thought that was like a brilliant touch. It didn't make the fight more fun to watch, of course, but he he felt he had such a big dude underneath him. He needed to control him that he couldn't pull that hand away to punch, and he couldn't even posture up or stand to throw knees because it would take enough <clears throat> weight off Nganu's back that Miocic felt he was going to be able to stand up. So he just made him carry his weight. Just made him carry his weight, made him think about getting up, but never gave him the actual window in which to do so. I loved that. Like, that was that was experience coming into play. That was a fighter who knew exactly how he needed to win this fight down the stretch. Yeah, it was, it, it was an exceptionally impressive performance. And I think it gets at the heart of, I think, why at least I have such a blind spot for Miocic. Sure, me which too, is that obviously. There is nothing... Okay, so Miocic hits hard. He's a crisp boxer. He is a solid wrestler. I don't think he's. I don't think he's the best wrestler in that division. Um, he's. He's not the best boxer. He's a pretty good boxer. He's not the best wrestler, but he's a pretty good wrestler. He's just smart. He does the right things. He has the right game plan. He has the right tools in his arsenal, ready mm -hmm. for pretty much everybody that he fights. And he's smart in the cage. He makes good decisions mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> about what to do. The the thing that really stood out to me here was like. The after the mid range comment, right? Like your what his what his coach said, Miocic gauged the distance. He knew what Nganu's range was going to be, and he started hitting him back. This was after about the first two minutes or so of the fight, and it continued the later the later on it went. Is Nganu is used to getting his counter off, and that being the end of things, right? Um, what Miocic started doing a really good job of as the fight went on was countering the counter, just drawing, it, throwing something to draw out the counter, then countering the counter mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And I think we mentioned this, that like if the exchanges started getting layered, that probably wasn't going to, to behoove Nganu as the fight went on because Miocic has more depth of skill. Uh, he has a better sense for variety, for what to throw when, uh, that that was going to be a problem for Nganu if, if it got into that kind of space. Miocic exploited that to a T. Every time Nganu threw something with his left hand, there was a counter right waiting for him. Mm -hmm. Every single time it was ready it was ready and waiting for him there. Nganu deserves a ton of credit for taking that punch, which has put down yeah. uh, a whole lot of dudes. I said, that's know? a question we learned, one of the questions we didn't have answered before this fight that now we definitely know the answer to. Nganu has a chin. You can question a lot of things about Nganu after this fight. You could question his preparation. You could question his training camp. You mm -hmm. could question... Um, the approach that he had coming into the fight. You could question his maturity as a fighter. You could question some of the decisions that he made. There's a lot of things that you could question here. You can't question his toughness. And you can't question his heart. A lot of dudes would have just quit um, at various points in that fight. But Nganu didn't quit. He kept throwing. Even when it was clear he had no answers for what Miocic was throwing at him, he stuck in there. He took a fair bit of damage over the course of that fight. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, I think he deserves some respect for that. But, but to come back to Miocic, like... He just does the right things all the time. Um, I, I like it's hard to overstate how little that stands out, at least to me. Maybe it stands out more to other people uh, who are better at evaluating him. <laughs> but like he just does things right. And that goes a really long way in a, di in a division where your margin for error is extremely small. Right. Like your every punch could be the very last one. Every single punch could be the one that ends your night, ends your reign as champion. And Miocic is a guy who just doesn't, who just doesn't fuck up very often. Yeah, like he's still not a great defensive fighter, I don't think. But he's though he's getting better. He he did a fairly good job of. This was some of the some best of head movement we've seen from him. 
Um, yeah. and, I, and I think too, though, like, like Miocic has always had some defensive moves. It's that they vanish when he's attacking, and that still yeah. seemed to be the case here. When he was putting his punches together, that's when Ngani was hitting him without too much difficulty. But when he was thinking defense, it looked really, really good in this fight compared to past bouts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's true. That's a that's a good point. Um, like, yeah, I, I think it's it's hard to give a guy the credit he deserves just for being good at everything and not fucking up well fuck ups uh, fuck ups have mean a lot at heavyweight you know like do. That's, mis- but that's exactly that's exactly it and i think that's kind of the 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 i think that's kind of the root of the epistemological issue here. <laughs> oh my Ooh, we're getting epistemological in here uh yeah it's because it's it's like there has to be some kind of systemic reason why i keep picking the uh, keep picking the wrong outcomes for stupid miocic fights and I really think it's just a failure to understand the extent to which not fucking up and being good at everything is is a is worth way more than the sum of its parts, I guess, is the way that I would put that. Yeah, it just makes him a really adaptable fighter. And I think we, we mm-hmm. do have to celebrate how game planning and execution of game plan uh, of a game plan seems to basically be responsible for his incredible run now, especially his last four fights like um well, Verdum really ran into it uh, and kind of gave it to him. But after that, like, put, turning up the pressure against Overeem is absolutely what you should do against Alistair Overeem. Miocic came out in that fight pressuring like we had never seen him do it before, and I think that makes sense. He made the decision to do that. I don't know if it was the plan all along, but Junior Dos Santos quickly started fucking up Miocic's leg, and he noticed, of course, that Junior was going to be backing himself into the fence and put the pressure on him. Now we see in this fight, there is still another version of Miocic, the one who beat Roy Nelson, the one who outboxed Gabriel Gonzaga, uh, who can fight from the outside, who can let somebody chase after him. And yeah, like that's an adaptable fighter. That's a fighter who is comfortable changing up their style to meet the needs of the man in front of them. Uh, Ooh, phrasing there <laughs> to, meet the... to meet the needs of the man in front of them yeah a lot please, of different ways we could go with that please don't tell steepy i said that please uh <laughs> okay, but so... but seriously like to to answer the specific task put before him steepy mm-hmm. miocha is like he's more adaptable than most of the other fighters in this division and god damn it's made him the first heavyweight champ to defend the belt three times i didn't pick i didn't pick him once during all of that run but I really think that seems like the answer is just Miocic. Yeah, he makes good decisions and he fights to a game plan really, really well. And he can do a lot of different things at a consistently high level. Yeah. So what's next? What's next for Ngannou? Yeah, well, I mean, frankly, I do want to uh, I do want to address some people. There have been some people who, who have taken this too far. Now they think Ngannou is a bust. Ngannou is like a like Sokaju. Where, oh, now we know he can't do shit. Like, reminder, Nganu's been doing this for just over four years. He's only had six UFC uh, fights in total now. Was this his seventh? Um, this was his seventh, I believe. This was his seventh. He's 31, so he's essentially an 18-year-old by the standards of any other division. He has time. And still, as we saw, by the just the damage he did to Miocic's face with only, like a dozen or so odd punches in that first round, mostly this is still a terrifying force in this division. I want to see him step back. I mean, I think this fight definitely shows us that he's psychologically experience has not prepared him for this level of competition. And he needs some of that experience to prepare him. The difficulty is still going to be getting in a lower level opponent whom he can't just blow out of the water because now it's like as his trainer, you're dealing with a delicate balance of, you know, overconfidence versus malaise after suffering his first big loss. Um, yeah. You, you I, like, I, I would say you give him somebody like a Tim Johnson or you give him somebody, you know, uh, like slower, slightly lower down. Is he just going to obliterate them? <laughs> I mean, well, I'll, tell, I'll tell you who they should give him. Yeah. Um, I think they should give him Alexander Volkov. I thought of that. I thought they might That's... they might want to avoid uh, rubbing Volkov out, you know, as a contender. But who knows? Yeah. Well, okay. So like Volkov or Tibura or yeah, um, yeah. I could see Tim Johnson. Somebody like somebody along those lines. 
whom, like you, like you said, he can't just get out of there right away. Somebody who takes a pretty good shot, um, who has some depth of skill, who can challenge him in a couple of different areas. Um, yeah, but it, it's hard to do that. And, and, and really, I, the, the test for Ngannou's maturity, too, is maybe that he can go in there with an opponent that he could destroy in the first round, and he doesn't. Um, so if, I, if I'm like Ngannou and Ngannou's trainer, I'm thinking, we're going to go in there and deliberately not knock our next opponent out in the first round and get some work in, get some time in the cage to, to feel what a fight really feels like when it's uh, not all going your way, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's it. Like, it doesn't sound like either you or I thinks that Ngannou is like a, is like a busted prospect now. Oh, no. Uh, his and... prospect loss was for the title, as somebody said to me on Twitter. <laughs> and when when your prospect loss comes at the title level, you're probably doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think he probably needs to find some new trainers. There seems like there is, it seems like there is a kind of a or do, or different sparring partners or something. I, I don't know. Like there whatever whatever the plan was there, either Nganu couldn't follow it or the plan wasn't good enough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how how much does it affect your? Because I read uh, Tim Bissell on Bloody Elbow did a great piece where he he interviewed and looked at the life story of of the coach behind Nganu and, and Fernand Lopez. Fernand Lopez, who who runs like the biggest MMA gym in France, and has mm-hmm. had a part in a lot of other uh, great fighters' careers. Guys like uh, Mpumbu and um, who else has he worked with? Um, I don't know. And there's there's been a few. A- anyway. Um, he he talked in that in that interview in that piece about Lopez did about being the bad guy, and I gotta wonder how much of the bad guy is he for Francis Ngannou when you when you do all of your training in Vegas with like one coach, and your coach is like falling down every time you hit him, that could be part of the problem. If you've got all, all, the whole world is saying, "Oh, you're going to destroy people," you do need your coach to say. This is how we destroy people. And if we don't, we can still be destroyed. And I don't know if that's present for Ngannou. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know about the psychology of their relationship. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I think maybe Ngannou needs to go on a little walkabout, um, a little gym walkabout. A little Curtis Blades action. Out. Yeah, do a Curtis. Uh, like lots of really good fighters have done things like that. Yoni and Jacek did that before she settled in at ATT. Sure. Tom Dukenwa did that before he settled in at Jackson's. Like Tom Dukenwa at various points, um, to speak of another French prospect who just suffered a, de- a fairly devastating loss. Um, he went to Nova Uniao. He went to TriStar. He he spent some time in Vegas. He spent some time in LA. Uh, he was all over the place before he eventually decided he was going to go to Jackson Wink. Stuff like that makes fighters better. Mm-hmm. Um, Mirsad Bektic did that before this camp. He went to TriStar. He went to a few other places, but, and I think he's back at ATT for the, his actual camp. You should travel. Go around. Meet some different people. Try out some different things. Um, but as for Miocic, who do you want him to fight? Kane? Kane, if Kane is at all healthy? Yeah, I mean, the only options on the table right now are, as far as I can see, are a super fight with DC um, or a fight with Kane. Like Fabricio's there, but Fabricio's kind of in top contender jail at the moment because he was just knocked out by Miocic and and hasn't looked phenomenal <laughs> besides. So it's got to be Kane when he comes back. Uh, personally, I would like to see Kane get a fight first. You know, I would, and I wouldn't mind if they were to do a fight with Daniel Cormier as a super fight. I, I would watch that. Uh, but DC said he has no interest, so. Well, he said he has no interest if Kane is going to be competing there. That's not quite the same thing. Yeah, but I think I think the the plan seems to be that Kane is trying to make his return. Yeah, so, and DC is going to put his career on hold to to wait for Kane. So, I mean, if, if there's any like if there's any division, we talked about this with women's bantamweight with the prospect of Nunes fighting Cyborg, but there are certain mm-hmm. divisions where I don't mind the champion holding up the belt a little bit to fight another champ or to to fight elsewhere. Light heavyweight's one of those places, and heavyweight is too. So, so speaking of which, yeah, uh, what did you think of Daniel Cormier's performance against Volkan Uzdemir? Um, looked like DC, you know, looked like Daniel Cormier. It was uh, as as I thought Joe Rogan quite uh, quite nicely put it before. It was no time versus the king of the grind. It was sort of the mm-hmm. dynamic of the matchup. I thought that Uzdemir, I mean, he came out hot, uh, but. Like, the difference between how Uzdemir 
who was kind of the boring Nganu. He was like the boring parallel to the challenger in the main event. Uh, there, there was a sharp contrast in how Uzdemir approached DC versus how Nganu approached uh, Miocic. Like Uzdemir knew when to take his foot off the gas a little bit. He came out aggressive, but he was putting his combinations together, changing things up, and it just didn't matter. Like at a certain point, he could not find DC's head enough. DC's defense is never getting better at this point. <laughs> he is going to lean and flail, and that is how he's going to avoid punches from 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 now till the end of his career. That's fine, but. The moment DC realized that he just had to start throwing and attacking takedowns and coming forward, the fight was his. That happened mm-hmm. about two or three minutes into the first round. DC hit a single leg attempt. Vulcan scrambled out, and then DC immediately followed up with a combination of punches. And you could feel the momentum turn. Yeah, right when DC was on was was putting the pressure on. And that is a testament to how good, how comfortable at pressuring he's become and how good of a pressure fighter he has become since that first run in with John Jones. Because the moment mm-hmm. he was pushing Uzdemir backwards, it was just like a walk in the park for him. He was just finding the mark over and over and over again. No trouble. Yeah, I thought Uzdemir really did a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. Like he was clearly well prepared for this. Yeah, uh, like he clearly, especially in the clinch, that was what was really, I guess, not surprising to me because I think John Jones wrote the blueprint on how to clinch DC. Yeah, uh, and, and how to effectively clinch him, which he was proactive about it, right? Like when they got close, Uzdemir made sure that he was going to be the one getting that underhook, stepping to an angle, creating space, landing the shot. Like he attacked DC in the clinch. He didn't let DC dictate the clinch and then desperately try to escape. Mm-hmm. Um, Looks strong that, in there too, with a strong guy in DC. Like mm-hmm. Uzdemir was was hanging with him in the clinch before it all started to, you know, yeah. go the I mean, other I way. Uz- yeah, I, I really thought Uzdemir did about as well as could possibly be expected, and the fight looked a lot like I thought it would. Uh, like it went maybe a little faster than I thought it would. I mm-hmm. thought it would take DC until the third or fourth round to do it, but um, DC ain't got no time either. DC has got to go back, get those sweatpants on, get them pulled all the way up to his armpits, <laughs> tuck the sweatshirt in. Like that takes time. It takes time to do that. I wish that uh, Dana White would put the belt around DC's chest when he puts it on him <laughs> <laughs> instead of around his waist. This is yeah. where this goes, right? Yeah, uh, I think, like, the other thing, too, I saw a video um, on Reddit, I think, of Uzdemir after the loss. It was a, I think it was a clip from, like, a future All Access episode or whatever. I don't watch any of the UFC's shows, so I don't know what they are. a big shoulder programming guy, Connor? No, not really. Um, But Uzdemir went back to the locker room and instantly started drilling takedown defense with his coaches. Like he wanted them to explain to him what went wrong and how he could answer it differently next time. And I think that more than anything says, we will be seeing more of not only Francis and Ganu in the future, but Volkan Uzdemir. Like who, who else is in the light heavyweight division right now in the UFC? That's going to be a meaningful contender in the future. After, I mean, DC we said he's going to retire in like a year, that. in like a year and a half. Like, where it could be, Volkan Uzdemir versus Glover Teixeira for the ti- for the sure. vacant light heavyweight title. That's I'm not joking. That's actually probably the most likely matchup. Probably, I, yeah. Or Gustafson, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. Um, Jesus. It's not, a, it's not a it's not a healthy division, is it, Pat? <laughs> no, and it's not going to get healthier either. Really, I don't think. Um, I abol- I think they should just abolish it and have a. Uh, and just have one giant heavyweight division that encompasses everybody for, who weighs between 220 yeah. pounds and 280 pounds. Do it old school like boxing used to be. Anyone above 200, you're a heavyweight. Yeah, I kind of I the you don't need to do that on the regional scene, but at, but in the UFC, there just is not enough talent to to sustain two healthy divisions here. Don't it's going like to look it. ugly. Um, but yeah, the yeah. I felt I, I did come away from this to, to kind of finish up based on what you were just talking about there. The Uzdemir has a really bright future. Mm-hmm. Like I thought he gave a good accounting of himself in a division that is otherwise mostly devoid of up and coming talent. Like, sure, I'm here for it. Let's let's keep rolling with Volkan Uzdemir. I, I like the way his punches go together. I like how he puts his combinations together. I, I like how he'll throw a right hand away and then target the left hand for where the opponent's head is going rather than just throwing rope punches. Like, he's really good. Like that's that's kind of the thing is he's actually a really good striker. Like a technically sound, technically gifted, very good striker. Not, offensively, not super. 
He's and he's actually got pretty quick hands. Um, yeah. He's not especially quick with his feet. He doesn't. He's not a great mover. Or his head. But he's got. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the that's kind of the mid career Dutch style. <laughs> it's just no defense whatsoever. But offensively, not no yeah. De- not no defense, but it's just really rote. Like yeah. this comes after this kind of thing. You throw the three punches and then you put both of your arms up and whatever's coming next shouldn't hit you. Uh, yeah. Unless you're fighting Daniel it's, Cormier. <laughs> it's, like, rote Dutch-style defense is entirely based on playing percentages. Uh, it is, how do I land more and more effective strikes uh, in, a, in a really limited period of time? How do I wear my opponent down um, based on the understanding that any one punch is unlikely to finish the fight? Like, that's, that's, really, that's really what it is. That's as, as an art. Mm. Um, that's, but I suppose that's a... That's a take for a different day. That's Connor. a take for a different day. And this has been like a half hour segment one, even though it was supposed Jesus. to be. May have to edit this down. Might just leave it as it is. Um, but we have a lot of other stuff to get into yet. And I realize I haven't previewed it. Maybe I'll add that in at the top of the episode too. me saying what the rest of the show is going to be about. I'm bad <laughs> at this. I've been doing this for so long and I'm not a good host. But you should feel bad. <laughs> here's what's coming up next. We're going to talk about Shane Burgos versus Calvin Cater. Fight of the night, for sure, as we expected. A fucking awesome kickboxing match between two very skilled young fighters. We're going to also talk about the other top contender for fight of the night, which also delivered some serious action. Tomas Almeida versus Rob Font. And uh, those both took place on UFC 220. After that, we're going to talk very briefly about Rory McDonald's bout with Douglas Lima for the Bellator welterweight title. That happened the same night as UFC 220, and we didn't have a chance to preview it last week. We're also going to talk about Aaron Pico, who fought at Bellator and delivered one of the most sickening body shot KOs I think I've ever seen in MMA. After that, finally, we are going to do a brief preview of Jacare versus Brunson, just not, sort of do a rundown of that card and highlight what our favorite fights are from it. All of that after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. And we keep rolling with Shane Burgos versus Calvin Cater. Pat, I loved this fight. I really, really enjoyed it while it was happening. I've watched it already twice, I think, um, since it happened. It was just a beautiful contest. Lots of adjustments happening from both guys. Big momentum swings. And a finish that seems to come out of nowhere. When Calvin Cater nicknamed himself the Boston Finisher... I don't think even he realized that meant he was just only going to get finishes in Boston. <laughs> but holy shit, <laughs> for his first finish in years, it was a violent one. I mean, he certainly made the nickname feel appropriate when he put Shane Burgos down with, like, just three nasty power punches perfectly placed, one after the other. How much you want to bet Calvin Cater looks like a genius on a double-end bag? Because he had no trouble finding Burgos' chin as he was wobbling crazily around after that first right hand. That fight fucking ruled. I oh loved my god, it. I love that fight. That fight was so good, man. It was every bit as good as we thought it could be, if not even better. Um, what, what was really striking to me was that I thought the momentum had turned, right? I thought mm-hmm. after about uh, the, the first couple of minutes of the second round, I thought it was Burgos' fight. It looked a lot like Burgos' prior fights have, where he starts to pick up on what you're showing him. He, la- he starts to land a little more. You start to feel his power. You start to feel his body work. Uh, and then the big shot comes. And then the momentum firmly turns. So, like, it's, a, it's both a round winning, but also a devastating knockout way of approaching a fight, right? Like, um, I thought that was – I was convinced – that uh, that it was Burgos's fight after that point. Did not expect Cater to land the to land the shot that he did. Yeah, but Burgos looks... was starting to time that jab. He was starting to get in with body shots. He was starting to counter it a lot with low kicks and uh, with um, combinations coming back and, and especially finishing to the body because Cater proved decidedly difficult to hit to the head for Burgos for a lot of this bout. 
Yeah, we d- we talked about Cater's defense, right, as kind of being a, a somewhat a somewhat rote thing, mm-hmm. uh, but he really did a good job of seeing. He kept his eyes wide open. I think he he really saw Burgos in this fight, um, and I I mean that in kind of an extended sense. Like he was reading him the whole time, and I, what. I think what neither you nor I really thought was that Cater had that third layer to him, right? Like this was a game of back and forth and back yeah. and forth and back and forth um, with Cater putting things out there, Burgos trying to react, Cater responding to Burgos's reactions. But then I think we we both kind of thought there would be a point where Burgos had it figured out. Yeah. Cater, but Cater went one layer deeper than that. He was playing with Burgos's responses to yes. what Cater was drawing out. It was like three or four layers deep. It was really, really, really really impressive that this is why when people ask one of the most common questions we get for the heavy bag or, or otherwise are people asking like, okay, what's the, what's the big technique that still hasn't been developed enough in, in MMA striking, you know, is it going to be the sidekick? Is that what we're going to see revolutionized next? Is it going to be this? Like what's the thing that still needs to happen? And my answer can only ever be the jab. I know that bores people because they want like the cool new TMA technique, but there is so much, that you can do with a jab. There is so much information that you can gather for yourself with a jab, but most MMA fighters to this day don't understand the utility of that weapon. They still see it as a weapon like any other punch. They see it as something you hit the person with, yeah, it's quick, so maybe you hit it with them first, and then you can hit them with something else. But Calvin Cater showed a great, deep understanding of how a jab can work. That, that's that's where the layers came from, is the, from where I saw it. He, he, he obviously was giving Shane Burgos tons of problems early in the fight with that jab, and then Burgos started to pick up on it. He became a more difficult target. He started to counter it. So then Calvin Cater used Burgos' reaction to the jab against him. The jab didn't have to land anymore. The jab had to force the reaction that would cause something else to land, and that's how the knockout began. Um I did talk, I think, when we previewed this about how um, – oh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Who's Calvin Cater's uh, coach, Rob Fonts? Mark Delagrati. Delagrati. Um, Delagrati, how his fighters sort of have like – I said they seem a little rote in ways that they have like sets of moves. Um, but with a full camp behind him, Calvin Cater seemed really capable of using those all of those moves at his disposal. And I talked last time about how Delagrati asked for him to throw a skip jab. And basically, it was the same instruction here, which also speaks to Cater's coachability. But just before the finish in this fight, um, and before the third round, Delagrati had instructed Cater to to start throwing more combinations. So Cater tried that. He he tried a combination early in round three, one two three. Nothing really landed clean, but it did get a reaction out of Burgos. And immediately after, from the corner, you could hear Delagrati shouting. Okay, now step in with it. Bring your feet with you after the jab and put something behind it. So Cater flashed the jab. It didn't really land. Burgos pulled his head back. But when the left hand came out of his line of sight, it was revealed to him that Cater had suddenly come much, much closer to him than he expected. And so he could not time the right hand that came after the jab. The jab didn't have to land. Cater knew how to use the fact that it wasn't landing to his advantage. And I... I fucking love that kind of thing. Um, it was really beautiful. That's man. depth. Uh, that is striking depth. Yeah. This looking at this. So we don't. So Cater appears to have all the tools. He's a finished product. It seems. It seems fairly clear to yeah. me. Like you're. This. This is a division right now where <clears throat> we have a pretty established kind of where we have the the top few fighters are pretty established. It's Holloway, Aldo, and Edgar. Um, then after that, it is totally wide open. Yeah, you have no idea who's going to step up, who's going to be the next guy. Brian Ortega is writing a nice thing. Josh Emmett recently announced his arrival in that division. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty wide open. Like it could be anybody who 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 takes the next step up. I would love to see uh, Cater in there with like a top ten guy next because he's a finish. He's effectively a finished product. Like the guy has been around for a long time. He's got tons of experience. You don't need to bring this guy along slowly and give him a bunch of different, like slow, but sure steps up. Like just, you could toss him in there with miles jury or, uh, the, the winner of, um, uh, if Bermudez beats Feely. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Dennis Bermudez is fighting on this next weekend's card. If he beats Feely, he'll probably jump up to like number 10, give mm-hmm. Cater that fight. Let him break into the top 10 that way. 
Exactly. If he can beat him. I mean, I think that's like the other thing is I think Bermudez is a really great fighter to test people who are trying to work their way towards contention because he can do pretty much everything. I think you could even give Cater Darren Elkins um, if you really wanted to. Yeah. Although it would break my the the Darren Elkins fan in my heart. (laughs) It would break that part of my heart because I do want to somehow see Darren Elkins working towards the title and that wouldn't do it for him. Yeah. Yeah. All true. Um, Very impressive. I really love. Uh, I really, really love Calvin Cater's game. And I also, this does not in any way diminish my enthusiasm for Shane Burgos. Oh, hell no. Like, he's only been fighting for four years. Has he? Yeah, he had his first pro fight in 2013. I didn't know that. Coming up on five years, I guess. Yeah, so like, this is his prospect loss. Damn, like, compare compare his, hold on a sec, there's a cat jumping on a fucking paper bag. Uh, I don't sure. know if you can hear that, but mere feet away from the microphone. Let me take care. Of it. Shane Burgos, five years yeah. in. Mm-hmm. I did yeah, not know a... that. I didn't. Somehow, yeah. I didn't realize that he was so inexperienced. Like he did, yeah. c- compare his level of skill to Engano, right? Like mm-hmm. this is somebody with a seriously deep game. Yeah, there there were people saying after this, like, man, somebody needs to tell Shane Burgos what CTE is. He's got no head movement. He was just easy. I'm like, you. Shane Burgos' defense is actually really, really good. Uh, Calvin Cater just has a phenomenally good jab, and it looked even better than it did against Andre Feely here. Uh, And I have to attribute some of that to a full camp. But, like, Shane Burgos, A, inexperienced, but B, how do you look at him and think that he's somebody who only knows how to slug with people? Like, he's he's turning into already a really, really sharp counterpuncher. And what you're going to see from him as time goes on is that he will slow the pace. Like young fighters who have like endless gas tanks because they can work themselves into insane shape because they're young. Um, like the dude is the dude is 26 years old. Like as he gets a little older, as he spars a little less, um, as he picks up an injury or two here or there, he'll slow the pace to the point where he's throwing, you know, say like 12 strikes a minute instead of 18 or 20. Mm-hmm. And he'll get hit less and you'll see his defense works even better in that regard. Like, He's going to, like, as his depth of skill grows, he's not going to get hit as much. Yeah. Um, like, a lot of, like, again, Jose Aldo versus Shoji Maruyama. Go watch that fight. See the future greatest defense, uh, single greatest defensive fighter of all time in terms of the very, in terms of the depth and layers to his defense. And watch him get lit up by a Japanese journeyman. Go, like, go watch young- Anderson Silva and his, like, Rumble on the Rock or Pride fights. Just getting <clears throat> tagged by people who are way worse technically than he would become in the future. Yeah, it's um, it's just this is the natural progression. It, yeah. And Shane Burgos, as a matter of defensive skill and moves, um, not the most layered dude yet, but he's got moves like he is way further along than it, you have the right to expect from any fighter yeah. four years into his career. So somebody said he, he doesn't know how to move his head, which baffled me because I thought, if anything, he relied on head movement a little too much in this fight. Mm-hmm. He could have used some more footwork and some more angles and kept his hands up a little bit to deflect some of Cater's long straight shots. It's, um, well, that's just a layers thing, though. Like, yes. you, you've your guys learn how to put those things together into various pieces. Like, a lot of young fighters have one defensive thing that they do, whether it's they step back or they move their heads or mm-hmm. they parry or they block. What you figure out over time is how to put those together into a into a coherent whole. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we got we got to move on here. We got a lot of fights left. To talk I know. About. Yeah. You, speak. You want to talk about Rob Font and Tommy Almeida real quick? Yeah, we'll make that one fairly quick. Uh, speak, speaking of of, of Delagrati fighters, Rob Font basically set up his finish over Tomas Almeida with the exact same move that Cater used to uh, to take the legs out from underneath Shane Burgos. He stepped in behind a, ha- uh, a left hand and followed with a very short right hand as Almeida reacted to the jab. Um, really, this looked like a fight that was, m- much like the last one, that was going the direction of the guy who got knocked out. It looked like Almeida had gotten his read after the first round. He was getting in some really nice shots at the end of the first. But honestly, here, un- unlike Burgos, like I think I can attest a lot of what happened to the fact that Almeida's chin just didn't very good. Uh, He can't afford to take like the the mistakes are much more grave for him than they are for most of the people he's fighting. And I mean, I don't know what to say about that. I think we may be starting to see the signs of where Almeida's ceiling really is in this division. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if not for the chin, 
he would be a really, really elite fighter, albeit one who probably gets hit a little too much for his own good. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you can't take shots, the bantamweight division, ironically, for guys who are not that big, is full of big-time punchers at the top and really dangerous offensive fighters. And there's just no place for a guy who can't take a shot in the top five or so. I think he'll be kind of a fringy top 10 fighter um, simply because his offensive skills are so overwhelming. And like, if he goes on a nice run, I could see him going on a nice run and kind of working his way up, but that's just a huge liability. He's also honestly not that young in his career. Uh, he's, he's been fighting as a pro in MMA since 2011. So he's now seven, he's now coming up on seven years in, he's had a lot of fights. He's taken a lot of damage. He had a Muay Thai career before he was in MMA. Like the dude has taken a lot of damage. His chin is not going to get better. Uh, and there are only so many ways of him being able to adjust his overall game to cover up the the basic deficiency in his inability to take a shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought Font did a really nice job of, of understanding that he needed to pressure Almeida, though. Um, the, the fight started to slip away from yeah. him after the end of the first round, and he came out in the second and just started walking Almeida down again, started staying in his face, making Almeida react. Almeida can react quite well. He's quite a good counterpuncher. Uh, counter striker because he's got such a diverse array of tools but he likes to draw out the opportunities to counter with his pressure and he mm-hmm. likes to be able to lead at will because the other guy is cornered and so uh, font did a great job of taking him back out of his element just when it seemed almeida was starting to get into the fight and i you know i would have assumed that almeida would probably be able to adjust to that but um Bad Chin and Rob Font being a particularly powerful puncher, that's a bad combination for Almeida. And I do want to say, Rob Font's, the actual finish, the Holly Holmes-style head kick out of the clinch or out of, like, the the, the phone booth, pretty fucking slick. That was some Mm -hmm. of the organic striking that I hadn't seen a lot of from Rob Font up to this point. Seeing him just notice an opening and just pluck it out of the air with the exact right strike for that position was impressive. Mm-hmm. That was really, 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 really uh, slick stuff from Rob Font. But what about Rory McDonald, Pat? We didn't talk about Rory McDonald last week. We um, we didn't preview his fight with Douglas Lima. We we're all focused on UFC 220. It was, um, I mean, here's the thing. This is here's an interesting parallel. Calvin Cater was actually fighting, I think, at the exact same time as Rory McDonald, and yet. I do think there was a stark difference in how, in what kind of dividends Calvin Cater was able to get out of his jab compared to Rory McDonald's jab against Douglas Lima. Um, many people who saw this fight uh, or, or haven't even seen it but heard about it know one of the big stories is that Rory McDonald had a person growing inside of his shin. To use his words, he devel- developed a hideous hematoma from the low leg kicks of Douglas Lima, but it was all because. Despite having an excellent jab, Rory McDonald could not stop Douglas Lima countering his jab. Every single time he stepped forward after about the second round, Lima was just destroying his leg with those kicks. And that didn't happen the same way to Calvin Cater that it did to Rory McDonald. I think that might actually speak to a sort of limitation either of McDonald as a fighter or of like the TriStar style of striking. You know what I mean? Not exactly. There's not a... Okay, so... I think, um, on the one hand, I get this impression that TriStar, that Faras and whoever else is working at TriStar, I don't know what the su- the whole supplementary team of coaches are uh, necessarily, but I think there's still sort of this idea that head movement is something that's too risky for MMA. Um, how often does Rory McDonald move his head? I think we've talked about this before, but I really, really think it has more to do with him having kind of stiff hips and a stiff back than it does some ideological commitment okay. to not doing head movement. Okay, that's right. We have like, talked about that. That's Yeah, I mean, but so I, I think – I thought Rory did a really good job of the, of handling the broad strategic context of this fight. Sure. Like I thought he did a good job of putting himself in position to win it um, with – not so much with his striking, and I think we we err by thinking of Rory McDonald as as a guy who really likes to strike. You know, I think given his druthers, Rory wants to be it, getting in on takedowns and and working you over from top position. That's really his core skill I mean, yeah. set. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I think Rory McDonald errs sometimes in thinking of himself as a striker. 
Yeah, um, I mean, I think we see that we saw that against Stephen Thompson. Right. Yeah, where like, he only went for two takedowns and one Imanari role <laughs> in that fight. Here, like one of my notes here, it's good to see Rory wrestling again. Like, that mm-hmm. was a huge component to his victory. It was the only thing that allowed him to survive, really, after those leg kicks. But it's something that he, from the start of his MMA career, has been an integral part of his game. His well-roundedness, I think, is his greatest asset. And it does kind of feel like he has been ignoring that a little bit more in recent fights and turning into more of a striker. Some of that, of course, has to do with the takedown defense of people like Robbie Lawler and all that. But he did a fin- fantastic job, uh, especially with takedowns from the clinch. Those body lock mm-hmm. twists that he was hitting uh, against the fence against Lima were really slick. And yep. he's not quite as dominant as GSP from top position, but he's definitely got the same style of ground and pound from positions like the guard that make him mm-hmm. like a really solid top player. Yep. He's yeah. And, and it was, so this, I, I think this was a mature performance from him mm-hmm. in the sense that he had to like, he couldn't get fixated on any one thing. I thought he did a really good job of dealing with Lima's jab. Uh, I think he did a great job of throwing that overhand right over the top of mm-hmm. Lima's jab, largely taking that away. He did a good job of uh, of throwing kicks of his own to take away Lima's middle range, where Lima's low kicks are, are the most effective. Obviously, he still ate a bunch. Uh, but um, I thought he did a good job of limiting the damage on the feet and putting himself in position to get the takedowns he needed when he needed them of using variety in his takedown game of not getting fixated on any one particular takedown. Um, He did a good job in the clinch. Um, That's this looked like a prime Rory McDonald to me. Like this is as good as this is as good as, as he's probably going to look sans that uh, Robbie Lawler fight. Yeah. But I seeing fights like this over and over, I do wonder like how much of Rory McDonald at his best are we going, going to be able to see. Um, like he still mm-hmm. took a lot of damage in this fight and not only to the leg, but to the face. Like I think his nose got messed up again, which seems like unavoidable at this point. Anybody who hits him in the nose just seems to, it just turns into a faucet. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> but, but there is something, I don't know. There's something about Rory's game where it's like he, he's, he's got all of these offensive options, but as a striker in particular, I, I think he's kind of easy to hit compare him to somebody like Calvin Cater who, who not mm-hmm. only was like playing with his his distance, but also started to play games with his tempo, you know, before he landed that knockout shot uh, or the shot that set up the knockout on Shane Burgos. He started sort of bouncing in and out at long range to play with, you know, giving Burgos something to time so that he could play with his timing. Like that's the kind of subtlety that doesn't fully exist in Rory McDonald's striking, that he's just kind of like this static fighter who sort of stands in front of you and uses his hands to block things and picks off jabs when he can. I don't know. There's, there's something that just sort of invites counters about the Ray Rory strikes. So I think this, this may come as a bit of a surprise because it's not necessarily the way that we're used to talking about Rory. He's not fast. He's not a fast fighter. That's a good point. He doesn't have, he doesn't have quick feet. He doesn't have quick hands. He is not fast. Um, when Rory was at his absolute actual physical peak was when he was about 22 years old yeah. and he was uh, and he was beating up BJ Penn with those combinations. But even those were not fast combinations. They were not Calvin Cater fast. They were not Shane Burgos fast. They were not Francis Ngannou fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were not Tyron Woodley fast. Rory does not beat guys by being faster than them. And as he ages, he's now 20, he's almost 28, I think. Um, and he's been fighting as a professional since he was 16. Like he's taken a lot of damage over those years. He's not going to get faster. And so when he's in there with guys who are legit high level athletic specimens like Douglas Lima, because Lima is really fucking fast, has always oh, been absolutely. really fast. Yeah. Like he's there's always going to be that speed differential, which means that when you are in striking exchanges with those guys where speed matters a lot, you're going to get hit a lot. Yeah, but that's why like, you play with things like rhythm. <laughs> that's why you give the guy something to thought, harder to time. Think, I do think he plays with rhythm. Mm. Um, I think he I think he plays with it a little bit with his jab. I think he did a pretty good job of mixing up the rhythm on his overhand counters that he was throwing in this. But no, he's not. He may also just not have an elite striker's feel. Like there's, yeah. we kind of take it for granted that over time you're going to develop these things. Some guys just maybe never really do. Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't have kind of that fundamental feel for yeah. it. Rory, because he's a workaholic and he's been and he's trained by guys who are workaholics, has made himself maybe to be into being a better striker than he has a real feel for. Mm. Yeah, that may be the case. Yeah, either way, 
it was good to see Rory McDonald wrestling again. And hopefully as we continue to see him in Bellator, like I want to see the well-roundedness of Rory McDonald coming to bear as often as possible. Yeah. I think this is going to make him into a really devastating veteran fighter. Sure. Frankly, like I don't know that he's ever going to be, I don't know that he's ever going to be um, a very top of the line kind of guy, like where he's like the best or the second best fighter at the, in, at welterweight. Mm -hmm. But like, I think you put him out there with, guys who have a little hole in their game who are on their way up. Like I think he would just fucking wreck a guy like Darren Till right now. Um, absolutely wreck that dude. Or I think he would wreck Mike Perry if he didn't get his face blasted off. Like anybody who has any sort of weakness in their game, anybody who has a mental lapse every now and again, like where McDonald is just going to tool those guys and probably will for another four years. Yeah. And definitely this was a fight in which like, if, so, if somebody's mental lapses played a part in it, Douglas Lima did not know how to respond to the full mm -hmm. array of Roy McDonald's skills. Again, like that okay. is that's what he's good at. It's doing everything got, really well. Got frustrated in the clinch, uh, got frustrated, uh, made bad decisions about playing from his back, uh, made bad decisions uh, with his footwork when he got pressured back to the fence. He mm -hmm. wasn't nearly proactive enough about trying to escape. Like there were, he made lots of mistakes um, yeah. and that's, and, uh, and Rory did a good job of exploiting those real fast. One more thing, Aaron motherfucking Pico, Aaron Pico, who, who fought somebody. I mean, this is matchmaking. The, the first fight he had in Bellator, his debut, we complained because he, they put him against somebody who had a reasonable level of experience against pretty good opposition. This time around, Aaron Pico fought somebody with much more experience, but against a much lower level of opposition and he got the win. That is how like protective matchmaking works. Um, so yeah, definitely a matchup that in terms of athletic talent favored Aaron Pico as matchups probably should at this point in his career, but Jesus fucking Christ, the body shot he landed on Shane Cro Crookston was savage. He, he didn't even get the full knuckle turn. He didn't even get his knuckles into the punch. He hit him with the inside of his hand and there was so much force on the hook. Honestly, it made me, it gave me secondhand nausea uh, watching watching Crookchen <laughs> tumble to the ground after taking that liver shot. Yeah, that is about the hardest you're ever going to see somebody get hit with a with a left hook to the liver. That was just Ugh. Jesus. I mean, Pico's physicality, his speed, like this this guy. So yeah, he lost his first pro fight, and we had a bunch of conversations about starting guys off slower. But he seems to have decided that his gimmick is just going to be he only fights dudes who are actually like at the very worst mid-level journeyman. Um, <laughs> so if that's your, I mean, if that's your gimmick and you lose the first one, maybe this is going to happen faster than we all thought it would. Cause the skills are there. This guy's talent. It, like speaking of talent, Jesus fucking Christ, man. Yeah. Like Jesus, have you it, like the speed, the athleticism, the power, the, the strength, like he's got the, that Mirsad Beck, the athleticism. The, the overpowering, I can toss you around at will. I may choose not to do so, but if I don't, that's because it's my choice. Mm -hmm. um, but the technical skills to back it up, man. Like, you're talking about a dude who has beaten elite, world-class competition as a freestyle wrestler. Uh, he's got, like, he's been boxing since he was a child. Like, the... This guy has the technical skills to back up the the way he went low kick to left hook to the liver here mm -hmm. with perfect balance and perfect rhythm. Like this is high level stuff. Um, I don't I, I mean, it, this I'm, I'm, I'm like my jaws just hitting the floor. <laughs> what we've seen from him in his last couple of fights. You All right. Know? Wipe your brow. Pat. <laughs> I you know how I feel about talent, Connor. You know how I am about this. <laughs> Oh, well, I've learned from Ngannou, so I'm predicting Aaron Pico to lose every single fight that he has for the rest of his career, and I feel confident in that decision. I'm I've never going nothing. to pick somebody based on talent again. I've never, I've learned nothing. <laughs> uh, uh, but no, it's, see, like, I want to say one more thing about this. Yeah. Because, you know what? Talent is fun. It is fun to watch people who are the absolute peak specimens of humanity do impossible things. That's why I like talent. And, you know, if that makes me vulnerable to a hype train every now and again, I'm okay with that. Some of us I'm all right with that. Pat, some of us think John Vellante versus Francis Marbojos is fun. Okay, so oh, shut the fuck this up. is a world that oh. has room for all of us. Oh, my God. It's not even it's that's not even a funny joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. I, I, 
think watching that fight that like this should be a lesson to everybody who pines for what MMA was like in like 2005 or 2006. <laughs> there were fights like this all the time and they sucked because yeah. guys would just like stumble or, like these slow dudes would stumble around the ring or the cage and throw one shot at a time for fucking 15 minutes and it was just like <laughs> it was awesome I'm though. Oh, by the oh, end, I was just. Oh my god! It, like the fact that you described that as oh, awesome. Listen, is, uh, listen, it was bad, but by the end, I was I was cracking up. I could not stop laughing by the end. I love how Bahos, Bahos would hold his left arm up. He would do like a high block and cover the whole left side of his head, and Volante would just wing a right hand at his head anyway. <laughs> like, he Volante doesn't. Say he, his, he broke his hand. Oh, I don't know. Something probably. I hope he did, if that's the case, like. Um, not that I hope he broke his hand, but I hope that that's a viable explanation for why that fight. That he just was just smashing a block over and over again with, with the man doesn't learn. Like he just doesn't learn from anything that's put before him. And boy, that was fight of the night. I, I, shout out to, uh, shout out to friend of the show, uh, Felix Biederman, uh, who many years ago now, when John Vellante lost a fight to Fabio Maldonado, um, said, you know, you can talk all you want about athleticism and you know, how, Volante was a who played football at Hofstra or whatever. Um, he just got nuked by a cool bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> the cool bus driver. <laughs> uh, so a classic yeah, I will, comment. I can never think about John Volante without thinking about him getting smashed by a bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, all right, all right, all right. We move on to the future. Jacare Souza is taking on Derek Brunson in a scintillating main event of next weekend's UFC card. There's some other shit on that undercard, namely Drew Dober versus Frank Camacho. That's going to be goddamn fire. We're going to give a brief rundown of that card after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve, so thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And we are back. We are now going to talk about the future of MMA. Uh, Nganu Miocic has come and gone. It'll probably be like a 400, 500,000 pay-per-view card, uh, 500,000 if the UFC is lucky. And now we're moving on to more uh, <laughs> week-in, week-out violence. This is a UFC on Fox card. Uh, Jacare versus Brunson 2 is the main event. Uh, honestly, I, I don't know why, but I feel like this is like one step above uh, the, the following week's main event, which is Machida versus Anders in terms of how. <laughs> How, how little I am excited for it compared to what we just saw last weekend. <laughs> We're really, really and truly, we are coming up on a rough stretch of cards here. Like the, what it wouldn't be so bad if they were like, if they were not all one after the other, but we have a card this weekend, a card the weekend after a card, the weekend after a card, the weekend after a card, the weekend after that, <clears throat> a card, the weekend after that. It's like seven weeks. Uh, and then finally we have a week. Finally, we have a week off. Yes. So the problem here is that none of these cards stands out in any meaningful way. Like even the, like you, we really are waiting until a UFC 223 for a card that looks like a big one. So that's the word we're looking all the way until April before we have a card that stands out on the strength of its lineup. Might be a time for topics, maybe some retrospectives on some of our favorite <clears> fighters. <throat> You know, from the past, maybe uh, not just covering the UFC schedule. Because, yeah, there, there are de these are definitely cards with potential that if you were to condense the upcoming schedule into four, maybe five cards, you would have a much stronger night of fights. Because there are things here to care about. Like the main event. A lot of, lot of things. Some really good fights. Yeah. Like the main event doesn't, it doesn't immediately excite you because like it, it, both of these guys – for whatever reason, especially Derek Brunson, just kind of feels like he's in limbo. Jacare feels like he's too old to probably work himself back into contention. So for outside reasons, I'm not super interested in that. But we've got, 
I mean, Andre Feely, Dennis Bermudez, that's going to be fun. Those are top 10 featherweights. Well, Feely's not anymore, but still, that's going to be action. Gregor Gillespie is fighting here. That is someone to watch at lightweight. That is an important fighter. Drew Dober versus Frank Camacho is going to be, that is like perfect Fox card, uh, main card filler, because it's going to be an insane action fight. That doesn't really mean much, but it's going to be really good to watch. Um, I like Bobby Green versus Eric Koch. I think that's strong matchmaking. I like Bektich versus Pepe. I don't have a lot of specific complaints. It's just that, like, just bolster him a little bit, you know? It doesn't have to be every weekend, right, guys? <laughs> well, it does because that's the contract that they've signed with <laughs> with Fox. Yeah. Like, that's um, – but for one moment, I want to let business intrude on our, on our fight discussion here. Like, the, if you – the UFC is currently in a contract year. They are negotiating their next TV deal. Um, the current Fox deal is up at the end of 2018. Like – this is the time when the UFC, if it were capable of doing so, would want to be putting its strongest product out there. Mm. The fact that this is the product that's out there says a lot about what the UFC is actually capable of delivering. And it tells us a very great deal about what their next TV deal is going to look like, which is to say not not what they were hoping for and not a massive improvement on their current one. They're getting like – I think they with the escalators, they're up to 120 or $130 million a year on their TV deal at this point. They thought they were going to get somewhere in the range of 400 to 500 million a year. Mm. Um, that was their projection, but their ratings are stagnant or at the very best growing slightly. Um, I would expect them to be fairly down through most of this year. And so if they get 200 million, that's going to be a huge accomplishment for them. I think that's about what they're going to get. So there, but there isn't really a positive way to spin that. And I think you're going to see that reflected in kind of the quality of the TV cards that we see for the next few months. I wish they would just go to Fight Pass or something. You know, just put the cards on Fight Pass more. And it's it's not super viable for them I to know. do that. I know. It's unfortunately There's still they, so much TV need... money to be made. Well, it's not that there's so much TV money to be made. It's that there's just more there than there is through yeah. an all in one subscription service like yeah. The UFC's audience is frankly not as big as the WWE's, and even with the WWE, there's a real question as to whether they erred by, for example, putting WrestleMania on there. Mm. Uh, but leaving that aside, uh, coming back to the here and now, Jacare <laughs> versus Brunson 2. This is their rematch. Jacare knocked out Brunson in a strike force fight a few years back. What's your read on this? Um, before I can answer that, I have to ask what Derek Brunson's going to show up <laughs> <laughs> because there, there, there still has this feeling that they're, they're the duality of Derek Brunson, that <laughs> he can be a, an insane maniac who just knocks people out in the first round, or he can be a little more tactical. Um, I think being an insane maniac might actually work for him against Jacare a little bit, but I think also the approach he took to Leota Machida, which was sort of like, that was the sort of the marriage of the two Derek Brunsons coming together keeping the pressure on, being relatively aggressive, but picking your shots, putting your combinations together as the other person throws. Uh, the big dynamic I see here um, is that Jacare, especially as he's getting older, what is he now, like 39? Yeah, he's up there. He's old now. Like, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double check it here. But the, the big dynamic here is, I think, Jacare's volume um, and how he's 38. And how Derek Brunson chooses to play with the fact that Jacare is uh, most comfortable coming forward, but does not like to throw very much. Probably can't throw very much. I'm not sure what kind of pace he can actually push if he is made to push. Probably but, about ten. Probably about ten strikes a minute is what you're looking at from him as a max. I or, would say so. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I. I mean, I think that is an important dynamic here. Like I, I'm, I'm expecting that Derek Brunson has a serious shot here in their rematch compared to their first fight, just because he is still, uh, I think, very near his athletic prime compared to Jacare, and uh, hits really, really hard, and has uh, a higher volume game at his disposal. So I think that might be the key here. I don't know. What do you think? What's your read? Um, I could make a case for either guy, frankly. Um, the first is that Brunson, if he is not in full on pressure mode, often allows himself to be pressured. Like there's, there's very little middle ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Brunson is either kind of coming forward 
against an opponent who is not trying to come forward or he's getting pushed back by an opponent who is trying to push him back. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's just kind of I, I don't really know why. Like, but there's no real middle ground between the two. Like if you're pressuring Brunson, you can you can make some hay. Anderson Silva pushed Brunson back to the fence a lot mm -hmm. when they fought. Well, like I, a lot. I, I think back. it's because he doesn't have a ton of like defensive options that he feels comfortable with in the pocket. He he doesn't yeah. feel comfortable standing his ground because being an athlete and leaping 10 feet away when someone throws at you is his main method of defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's probably true. But so that means that he's kind of at least to this point, this doesn't mean that this can't change. Um, but it does mean that if he's pressured, he tends to struggle a little bit because mm -hmm. he doesn't ha he's not much of a counter puncher. He doesn't throw a lot off his back foot. He has a, a straight left that he throws occasionally. But for the most part, he's a guy who does his work moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so if Jocker, if he allows Jockeray to pressure him, Jockeray is in pretty good shape to, to kind of impose uh, to impose his game for sure. It, but if Brunson kind of decides that he's going to be the one to seize advantage and pressure, he he can I, I think he would knock Jockeray out if he really goes after him. Jockeray can throw some really nice counters. He throws a really nice, uh, really nice right hand counter. He can throw a left hook as a counter, but there's not that many layers to it. You know, mm -hmm. like it's more of a stop doing that as opposed to I'm drawing you onto a shot. Um, so and, and when it comes to the takedown game, Brunson has never been taken down. That's astounding. That's really astounding. Yeah, he's never been taken down. Now, with that said, the only guy who is a good takedown artist who's tried to take him down is Yoel Romero. And that was when he wasn't doing that's when he wasn't. That really was fine. your Romero's. I, I have totally stopped wrestling phase. <laughs> Yeah, he, Brunson was the last fight of Yoel Romero's I've totally stopped wrestling phase. It was the next camp when he fought um, uh, uh, Brad Tavares when he did a ton of wrestling in his camp and just mm. tossed him around. Yeah. So and Brunson, remember, took him down took Romero down like three times. Mm -hmm. Didn't get much done, but took him down. Brunson's like, a solid wrestler. But, yeah, it is worth pointing out, looking at his, his, his UFC record here. Not a ton of takedown artists actually on there. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think who was the last guy to uh, let me look at this. I, I went through this last night before we talked. The last guy to try to take him down. It's probably Daniel Kelly, right? I, it was Juan Carnero tried to take him down. Dan Kelly. Oh, Dan Kelly didn't get the chance to try. Did not get the chance to try. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that first uh, round Derek Brunson style. <clears throat> yep. So I don't, this this to me makes it a really hard matchup to call. Uh, I think if we see low kind of low volume tentative Brunson, Jacare can make a lot of hay moving forward in that kind of fight. Could even take him down. I think uh, if he pins him against the fence, if he gets him to the fence, I think uh, Jacare could control Brunson there. Mm -hmm. In open space or with Brunson pushing you back toward the fence, he's a monster. Mm -hmm. But if you, but if you've got the underhook, I think Brunson is kind of in trouble in that matchup. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I have tr problems trusting Jacare because of his age, but I don't really trust mm -hmm. Brunson because he's Brunson. Um. So I think I'm going to go with Jacare. Succinct, but fair. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I think I'm going to go with Jacare. Like, I, I, I just have this feeling that Brunson's going to try to pressure him early and is going to lose his cool. Uh, and if that happens, if that is the Derek Brunson that shows up, if that's the approach he takes, then Jacare definitely has the experience and the composure to just kind of stay on him and grind him out. Do you think Jacare can fight for five hard rounds? I think he probably can. Um, I mean, it depends on the pace, but I don't know that Derek Brunson can fight for five hard rounds because if it's the moment it becomes a hard round, it's like he can't turn it off after that. He's just mm -hmm. going nuts, and then it's it's not a choice. Uh, although, you know what? Like, he'll pr he'll probably not go after Jacare that way, now that I think of it. But I don't know. How do I know what the fuck Derek Brunson's mind is thinking? <laughs> what What's the approach he chooses to a particular opponent? Well... I don't know. Um, Jacare's age and the fact that he has never taken a great punch worries me because Brunson does hit really hard. Yeah. Um, but can Brunson fight off his back foot, kind of stick and move? Man, this is <laughs> this is really hard to call. It's made harder I, by the fact that I don't care that much. <laughs> I, I think that's also a fair corollary. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm I think it's going to be Jacare, but I say that but I say that with a lot of caveats. Okay, is is there a fight that you care about more on here that you would more like to discuss yes. than that one? Uh 
I, I know you probably don't care about this. I really care about Drew Dober versus Frank Camacho. Um, I'm just going to I'm just going to mute my microphone and let you talk about that. <laughs> Frank Camacho has been absolute appointment viewing since his signage to the UFC. I don't know how many of his fights uh, people listening have caught. I don't know how many of his fights you've caught or remembered, Pat. But um, he showed up, fought J- uh, Jing Young Lee, fought the leech, my boy. Um, absolutely threw down with him, lost energy down the stretch. Then he comes back and fights Damian Brown. Very similar kind of fight. In in Frank Camacho, we have a quite technically capable boxer who loves to fucking brawl with people. Um, or maybe hates it and just can't resist brawling. But either way, he's got this really pleasing combination to me of, of having a lot of different technical answers to what his opponent is doing and also being a wild man. And Drew Dober is somebody who has quietly been getting better but is also a bit of a scrapping, uh, a scrapping maniac in his own right. Um, Drew Dober has been, I think he's at elevation and has been for a few years, has really been improving and making small but steady strides at that camp. He's a veteran of the game, but he's still only 29 years old. I think we may be seeing Drew Dober coming into his own. So I think it's going to be like a tactical Drew Dober versus a, an, an, a Frank Camacho who cannot be anything but wild after a certain point in the fight. And uh, so I like Drew Dober's kicking game. I like his clinch and his wrestling to be the deciding factors against the swanging and banging Frank Camacho. But I highly recommend you watch it. If you need a reason to, 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 to tune into this card, catch the main card opener because it's going to be fun. Frank Camacho knows nothing but war, and Drew Dober has usually been pretty willing to uh, let those kinds of things happen. So... I think uh, I think Dober is going to take him down a bunch of times. Yeah, probably, probably. Whether he can hold him down, I suppose, is a slightly different question. But uh, yeah, watch that fight with your eyeballs. It should be fun. <laughs> Pat's, uh, Pat's on board. What about you? What's what's your your uh, your secret little gem on this card? Um, Gregor Gillespie versus Jordan Rinaldi. I really like that fight. I've always liked Jordan Rinaldi. I've always thought he was fun uh, and and pretty good. Um, I don't feel like I have a great read on Jordan Rinaldi. Like, what is it you like about him? Uh, I think he's he's scrappy. I think he's got a lot of different things that he does pretty well. I think he's basically a, a real good journeyman. Um, I've always just kind of enjoyed that about him. He's a good, fun journeyman type of fighter. Uh, but I really like Gregor Gillespie. That's mostly about Gillespie. Mm-hmm. I think Gillespie is really, really good. I like. I've enjoyed watching his evolution. I've enjoyed watching how much better he's gotten as time's gone on. Uh, I think he's going to take Rinaldi down a bunch of times and kind of wear him around the cage like a hat, and I look forward to seeing that. Also, Rin- Rinaldi is one of the two guys, uh, well, the only guy not named Ovin St. Pru or Von Flew to finish a Von Flew choke in the UFC, which is pretty cool. Um, that's true. He's... Yeah, that's the kind of reason why I like Jordan Rinaldi is because he gets a Von Flew choke. Because <laughs> he like... hits Von Flew chokes. Greg yeah, Gillespie, I think, though, I think like, Gregor Gillespie, like small for the weight class, could probably be fighting at 145, but looks like a sort of blend in, in that mold of like the, the last great little lightweight in Frankie Edgar, a sort of a blend of that approach and like the Mirsad Bektic super aggressive wrestler boxer approach. Um, yeah, Gillespie was a really, 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 really good wrestler in college, like really, really good and has taken to grappling very nicely and has now started to add some flashes of a, of a striking game. He's got some pop in his hands. Like that's a, that's a good fighter right there. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he'll have as much time, to develop that game the way Frankie Edgar did. Cause like um, Edgar also was a good offensive boxer who moved a lot before he really learned the ins and outs of, of defense and, and boxing tactics. And how old is Gregor Gillespie? Gillespie is 31, 31, right? So we're but not, he's only been fighting since 2014, right? So he may be developing faster. I think he's, he looks like a pretty, um, a pretty good athlete. And, and seems to be picking up things quickly, he seems really comfortable already. But I don't know how much more striking skill we're going to get out of Gregor Gillespie before his time starts to run out. Um, yeah, that's that's probably true. I don't think of him as a future ta- champion type of fighter, but I enjoy his game. Hell yeah. Um, and they have kind of taken their time with him in pushing him up. This is his fourth fight in the UFC, and it's against Jordan Rinaldi. So they're they're taking their time with him they're they're letting him develop i just i like him a lot i'm also excited speaking of developing mirsad bektic's long awaited return after getting embarrassingly finished in the third round uh, by darren elkins he's fighting godofredo pepe 
that's uh, that's an interesting fight. I think the likely outcome is Bektic just taking Pepe down, fighting through his submission attempts, and beating the shit out of him from the top. But I am excited to watch it. Yeah, I think it'll be. I mean, Pe- Pepe even gave Shane Burgos a little pause uh, when they fought because he he will swing for the fences, hits hard, and has he he's definitely not a comfortable brawler. Like he he gets pushed into brawling, but he is willing. Uh, he, he he will throw bombs and, and one after the other long combinations. Like I think it's a, it's a dangerous, but suitable comeback fight for Bektish after that last one. Um, and, and again, like um, not quite on the Nganu level, but Bektish's prospect loss came against a super experienced tough vet in Darren Elkins, who was on a really good winning streak in this division. So I think that we, we are both still looking for Bektish to put those pieces together. And that's probably the kind of loss he needed to learn how to manage his energy, to learn that sometimes you can destroy somebody and they can still come back to destroy you after that. Uh, he needed that, I think. So I'm interested to see if he'll approach Pepe in a little bit more of a, a, a cautious tactical way or if he'll look just the same as the old Mirsad Bekdic and, and treat the Darren Elkins loss as a fluke. I don't know. Time will tell. All right. Well, that's I think that's most of what we care about on this card. Really, the stuff to talk about today was UFC 220, Rory McDonald and all of that business. But we will be back next week, not only to recap this, but uh, oh boy, what's the next week's card? Oh, Machida Anders. I already mentioned it. <laughs> Okay, so we'll be back next week with some kind of topic, <laughs> probably, to discuss uh, in addition to recapping this. There's, and... there's some good fights on here, man. Like, not great fights, but yeah, yeah. there are fights that we could discuss and not feel like we're wasting our time. There's always... High bar, I realize that. But... There... <laughs> there's always good fights. That's the thing. There's all... There always are good fights. It's just... it's just a matter of mustering the enthusiasm. What, is it... what does it all mean, my, uh, my existentialist friend? What does it all mean? <laughs> what does it all mean? Uh, so th- thank you for listening to this very um, existentially meaningless edition of Heavy Hands. I have been Connor Rebush. Find me on Twitter at Boxing Bush, B-U-S-C-H. And find my co-host, Dr. Patrick Wyman, on Twitter at Patrick underscore Wyman. Just before we wrap up, Pat, I'm going to give you the chance to plug yo shit. Um, let's see. What am I even doing this week? I have a new episode of Tides of History coming out looking at life in Renaissance Florence following a couple of uh, composite characters that I've put together through the landscape of the city's economy, uh, a little bit on its politics, um, and then some on its culture about the about the Renaissance of art and learning and how that played out in uh, in kind of average people's lives. Cool. Sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> That's, that's literally it. I think that's the only thing I've got coming out this week. All right. As for me, what are you doing? Uh, I'm working on a technique recap for this uh, for this card. I want to talk about some of the techniques. I, I really want to talk about uh, Calvin Cater versus Shane Burgos. So it is possible that at some point I will scrap the technique recap idea and just talk about that fight because it was so much fun. But uh, look for something to follow up. If you didn't see it already, you can... Uh, with, uh, with a smug look on your face, look over the questions I asked of Francis Ngannou at the end of last week and, uh, and reminisce about how they were answered by Stipe Miocic. And, um, yeah, I think that's about it for me, too. Sweet. Exciting. All right. I don't know why. I'm so low energy now at the end of the show, but this is, this is what the game does to you. You get worn down. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, this has been Heavy Hands. And fuck, I'm not supposed to do that. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. And if you came here this week for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. Bye.